Hello, and welcome to our online gastrointestinal diseases um, lecture for this semester. Um, I think it's kind of ironic that gastrointestinal diseases happen to fall on the Thanksgiving break. I kind of like to think of Thanksgiving and the day after as uh, days of incredible gastrointestinal distress for many of our patients. So oftentimes on Friday after Thanksgiving, they're pretty busy days for vet hospitals um, because we see the aftermath of animals getting some of the holiday um, food and some of the holiday treats that they probably shouldn't be getting. So <clears throat> if you're working on Friday, or if you did work on Friday of the week after, uh, or the week of Thanksgiving, um, you might have some stories to share next week. So um, maybe we can work that into our lecture somehow. All right, well, let's talk specifically about the anatomy of the gastrointestinal tract. This is sometimes called the alimentary canal or the digestive system. And make sure that if any of this looks unfamiliar to you that you pull out your anatomy text, which you should have beside you at all times. I mean, let's, let's get real. That anatomy book is, is a treasure trove of great information. Um, but uh, go ahead and review that digestive tract. This is um, from one of my lectures from anatomy where we just kind of go step by step through the gastrointestinal tract and see what happens in each area. Um, so of course our patient chews, prehends and chews the food um, in the oral cavity. And as it's swallowing, it passes through the pharynx and down into the esophagus. From the esophagus to the cardiac sphincter of the stomach. And into the stomach where the beginning initial stages of breakdown and digestion occur. Then through the pylorus, the pyloric sphincter, into the small intestine. The small intestine, of course, consisting of the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Then the ileocecal sphincter or ileocecal valve into the cecum, which in our carnivores that we're going to be mostly focusing on today, um, we don't see a very large or impactful or useful cecum. And then finally into the large intestine or colon and then the rectum and the anus. So there's our list sort of step by step through the gastrointestinal system. Now we can't forget about our accessory organs like the liver and the gallbladder, um, the liver producing bile, the gallbladder uh, storing the bile, and bile which helps to um, emulsify or sort of put fat into solution so that it can be properly absorbed by the small intestine. And then of course the pancreas, pancreas which is responsible in the gastrointestinal system for producing exocrine, um, compounds, specifically the digestive enzymes that are going to um, help to break down proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. And uh, please review what those pancreatic enzymes are because they're going to come into play in a little while. In fact, now would be a good time to just pause the um, PowerPoint, which you can do at any time, and write down what the pancreatic enzymes are. And if you can't remember them, look them up. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the normal stuff um, and gastrointestinal health. And our image here on the right is a, a photomicro photomicrograph, kind of an electron micrograph of uh, bacteria in the intestinal tract. And um, they've colored it in you know, these beautiful pastel colors because it's a beautiful environment in there in the inside of the gastrointestinal tract. It is, of course, not sterile. The inside of the GI tract is called a lumen, the inside of any hollow organ is called the lumen, and um, the, the amount of bacteria in there is kind of staggering. There's actually more bacteria in your intestinal tract, in your patient's intestinal tract, than there are cells in that entire organism's body. So um, the bacteria kind of rule um, the amount of uh, real estate and, and you know, sort of numbers. Um, you're made up more of bacteria than you are the cells that you think make you up. So it's kind of interesting. Um, so these bacteria we refer to as normal flora, which means they should be there, or commensal bacteria. And the term commensal generally means that these organisms can live in your body without causing you any harm. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that these, it's more of a symbiotic relationship where both organisms, bacteria and um, animal, get a lot of good benefit. Obviously the bacteria get to live in this nice warm 
cozy environment with lots of food. And the benefits that our patients get is that these bacteria actually help to break down compounds that are not digestible, helps to prevent colonization of bad bacteria or pathogens um, and viruses as well, and fungal infections and things like that. And then also the bacteria are going to provide some essential nutrients to the host. And a lot of times this consists of vitamins um, that are a byproduct of the digestion that the bacteria are doing. Um, and then it's important to have a balance between good and bad organisms. Um, that, that balance of good to bad is part of that normal flora in the GI tract. And if when everything is in balance or homeostasis, animal feels good, GI functions normal, no diarrhea, no vomiting, everybody's happy, you don't even think about the bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract. But any change in that normal flora, and especially if we get an increase in bad organisms or pathogens, this can result in disease and the consequence, uh, the consequence of um, clinical signs like vomiting and diarrhea, which we're most likely to see with the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and so this is called dysbiosis, when you have a change in the normal flora. And dysbiosis is not in your nose, but that's an important term to know, veterinary hospitals that you will be working in. And it's good to know what that means. So that's a change in the normal flora that results in disease, dysbiosis. Antibiotics can actually cause this problem of dysbiosis. Um, so you can have a bad result with antibiotics, and it can kill off some of your good bacteria or intestinal disease um, and uh, try and get rid of the uh, bad bacteria that are causing problems. So antibiotics can do a little bit of both. And especially once we talk about um, uh, herbivores, and specifically rabbits, guinea pigs, um, there are certain antibiotics that they just simply cannot have. Um, because of the, the bacterial makeup of their gastrointestinal tract. Um, some bacteria, uh, some ba sorry, some antibiotics will uh, wipe out all the normal commensal flora in uh, that animal's GI tract and actually can result in their death. So I'm going to be really careful and understand what antibiotics do what. Um, we're not going to cover that in this class, uh, but you'll get it in other classes. So just kind of a heads up as you move through the program, you're going to be made aware of those things. So we're going to spend a lot of time, um, and hopefully you're not watching this like on Thanksgiving or after you've just eaten a big meal, um, unless, you know, we vet types have strong stomachs, so maybe you could watch this while you're eating. Um, anyway, we're going to talk about, about vomiting <clears throat> and diarrhea. Vomiting and diarrhea are the two main clinical signs of gastrointestinal disease in the patients you see. Um, now, some of our patients can't vomit. Um, and those would be rabbits, horses, and also most rodents, um, including rats and guinea pigs and mice. They're unable to vomit, and so you will not see vomiting in those animals. Um, and that has to do with the anatomy, that has to do with um, sphincter tone, and that has to do with just the inability for some um, uh, sort of reverse peristalsis to occur in, uh, in certain animals. So it makes certain animals, um, you know, you can kind of cross one type of clinical sign off your list um, when you're looking at what's happening with the patient gastrointestinal wise. On the other hand, a lot of the animals that we're going to see, especially in small animal clinical practice, are going to vomit like crazy. So dogs and cats, they puke all the time. Um, and so we see a lot of vomiting um, patients in the dog and cat arena. Um, primates are on there too. That includes us humans, of course. People can vomit and we do with fair frequency as well. So. Those are our vomiting, not vomiting groups. Um, but all animals with a gastrointestinal tract um, can get diarrhea. And so uh, in clinical practice, you will see a lot of that. And if you have been working in animal care, you will see a fair amount of that. Because a lot of the animals that come in to um, our facility are stressed, or they come in with parasites, and they have uh, diarrhea when they get here, so or shortly after getting here. There are lots and lots and lots of causes of vomiting and diarrhea. We're going to kind of go through some of the big ones. Um, one that my husband just thought was absolutely hilarious the first time I told him what dietary indiscretion means. And basically, it's a really fancy medical term for your dog ate garbage or something else stupid. 
um, or cat, but let's be honest, dogs do it more than cats in general. Um, so here's this beautiful little Brittany Spaniel sitting in the mound of garbage. She looks very, um, both proud and maybe a little embarrassed that she got caught in the garbage. But anyway, so dietary indiscretion. This is um, eating lots of things we should not be eating. Um, this can sometimes include uh, a human influence. So uh, if you, as the owner of the dog or cat, are giving them foods that are potentially going to cause GI distress, then you're contributing to the dietary indiscretion problem. Um, toxins, things that are not food that can cause an obstruction, foreign bodies, um, those are all in that dietary indiscretion category. And then we have this big category of metabolic disease. Um, and this can include things like pancreatitis. And again, pancreatitis is where the pancreas itself, that organ, gets inflamed. And all of those digestive enzymes, did you write them down from before? The digestive enzymes, which ordinarily should only be dumped into the duodenum in, in an environment that can handle that kind of um, is itself, this causes uh, trauma and inflammation and pain and vomiting and diarrhea in your patient. Uh, renal disease, kidney disease can cause uh, vomiting and diarrhea as well, more likely vomiting, but as the toxins build up, if the kidneys are not eliminating um, the uh, urea and nitrogen products and creatinine, those toxins are building up, your patient is getting uh, nauseous and is going to be vomiting and sometimes having uh, gastrointestinal ulcers as a side effect of all that extra acidic compound circulating in the body. Um, hepatic disease, liver disease can cause vomiting and diarrhea as well. Part of that can be secondary to um, improper um, filtering of the blood through the liver and not getting toxins and other um, waste compounds out. And part of that can be um, associated with uh, a bile, um, a decrease in bile flow and a decrease in bile use. So we can have lots of different things on the metabolic or sort of organ system um, arena that can cause vomiting and diarrhea. And this is a lot of times why we'll do blood work on a vomiting animal or an animal with diarrhea. So we want to look and rule out or find um, any metabolic disease because that changes the picture pretty, pretty significantly. If you have a vomiting animal and you assume that the cause is dietary indiscretion and you do blood work and find they're in kidney failure, you've got an entirely different set of treatments to think about. So important stuff. You can then have bacterial um, causes of vomiting and diarrhea, and this is sort of like food poisoning. And this is what will happen to humans if we eat tainted food. Same thing will happen to dogs and cats. And that can happen here in the garbage, like this little Brittany's doing, or it can just happen in, in exposures to the big wide world. Dogs like to pick up all sorts of fun things when they're out and about in the world, walking or in the yard or something like that. And so um, bacteria is everywhere. It's growing everywhere. The three most common types of bacteria that can cause um, dysbiosis in a dog or a cat would be Campylobacter. And Campylobacter is uh, indicated a lot, or not indicated, what's the word I'm looking for? Implicated, sorry, implicated a lot in cases of human um, food poisoning. Same with Salmonella. And then we also see Clostridium being an issue with dogs. And sometimes a little bit of Clostridium is normal in the GI tract, um, but that can overgrow and that can cause a dysbiosis in our dogs and cats. One that's not on here is E. coli, and uh, we can definitely see E. coli causing um, a bacterial dysbiosis as well, but again, E. coli is normal to be found in the GI tract of dogs and cats. It's just the, the number of bacteria should be you know, within the normal range. And when it gets out of the normal range, you have dysbiosis and your patient feels terrible and they get diarrhea. All right, of course we can have viral causes of vomiting and diarrhea. Um, the worst type of virus that we see causing these symptoms um, is parvovirus. And again, parvo is going to essentially wipe out all of those normal little um, lining cells, the villi, um, in the small intestine. And uh, that really impairs absorption and impedes with digestion. And um, the patient just, you know, in an attempt to 
sort of clean out the GI tract, just starts to vomit quite a lot, and then also will have pretty significant diarrhea, um, mostly secondary to the inability to absorb um, any of the food that it's eaten. Parvo will often result in a bloody diarrhea, again, because of that lining is essentially just sloughing off and going out with the um, with the stool, so it can be pretty devastating. Um, coronavirus we've talked about as being typically not as significant as a cause of diarrhea, um, and usually it's mild and it kind of runs its course in a short amount of time, but it is a cause, a viral cause of diarrhea. Usually not vomiting with corona though. And for those of you in parasitology, parasites. Um, so we can see all sorts of things causing various degrees of vomiting and diarrhea. Giardia is really common to cause diarrhea in our patients. Um, and here's a picture of those little happy little trophozoites. Um, you know, we always show this, these pictures of trophozoites, but you so rarely get to see them in practice. But they're so fun to look at. Um, but anyway, Giardia. And then coccidia is another common cause of um, diarrhea in our patients. Not usually vomiting, but diarrhea. And then roundworm, hookworm, whipworm, all of our intestinal parasites have the potential to cause vomiting and or diarrhea in our patients. Um, and then finally, food allergy or intolerance. And allergy and intolerance aren't exactly the same thing, um, but they're kind of grouped in the same uh, category because it's all basically food. And so this can be um, a, a particular intolerance or allergy to an ingredient within the food. Um, typically, it's going to uh, be a carbohydrate or a protein source. Um, more often, the protein source is the uh, thing that the animal is intolerant to. And this varies just like it does with people. There are some people who are lactose intolerant. There are some people who have an allergy to uh, wheat gluten um, or shellfish or strawberries or, you know, all those different things you can be allergic to. Same goes for our dogs and cats. And generally, in our patients, that's going to um, manifest as vomiting or diarrhea. Although, interestingly, in dogs and cats, sometimes our food allergies can be manifested in dermatologic or skin problems, um, specifically itchiness and atopy. All right. Um, I know I said finally, but I forgot I had another slide after that. So <laughs> the causes of vomiting and diarrhea. Trauma. So trauma to the gastrointestinal tract. So this can be due to a foreign object, like you see here on the left that there's some sort of metal, weird metal piece that's stuck in the intestine of our patient. Um, you can have an intussusception, which is the little picture on the bottom down here. Um, not the very bottom, but the bottom of the sort of uh, drawing, uh, illustrated pictures, intussusception. And intussusception, super fun to say, kind of hard to spell. This is basically where a portion of the intestine will kind of telescope in. And so if you kind of look at the the, the shape there of the um, intestinal tract, it kind of folds in on itself, um, kind of like you, you think of a telescope and you collapse the telescope down. Um, and that is something that we see from time to time in our patients. Um, the, usually if that's happening, it's a, a younger dog or cat, a young animal, and it can be secondary to a foreign object in the intestinal tract that will kind of create this problem. But you can also see it with a heavy parasite burden. Um, and as you can imagine, both the foreign object and the intussusception are going to block that intestine. They're also going to cause damage to the lining of the intestinal tract there and uh, congestion of blood flow. Um, you can get necrosis if you don't correct those problems right away. Um, so they're pretty, pretty dramatic and um, not great things to happen to your patient. And then the last picture over there on the um, left, the incarceration, this is if your patient has a hernia or a hole in the body wall, and if it's large enough, some of those intestines can slip through and kind of get squished in that area. Um, and so that's one of the reasons whenever we find hernias, in, uh, especially umbilical hernias that are kind of right there at the, well, it's up there at the umbilicus, obviously, but <laughs> at the ventral aspect of the body and, you know, kind of gravity will pull the intestines towards that area. Um, we check that frequently for um, hernias and, and make sure that they're nice and small so that an intestinal loop cannot fit through because it's, it's very bad for your patient if you if that happens and you don't realize it right away. Um, and then I think this is finally neoplasia. And that's the picture down here at the bottom. So what you see here are a surgeon's hands holding a loop of intestine out of the abdomen. Um, you can see the intestine overall looks 
looks kind of beautiful. And this, this is good for you guys to look at because it looks different than what we're used to seeing in anatomy. You can see some pink and healthy. Those blood vessels are beautifully rich and full of blood. But then right in the center there is this big gnarly mass. Um, and that is a tumor of some kind. And these, any kind of intestinal mass can happen um, sort of on the outside, on the outer lining. They can happen on the inside or they can happen in the wall of the intestinal tract as well. Um, and this one, it's so hard to tell where this one originated because it's enormous. Um, but you can bet that that mass is um, interfering with movement of digested materials through the intestinal tract, probably interfering with digestion and absorption a fair amount. So this patient, my guess would be this patient's had some weight loss. This patient's probably had some vomiting and or diarrhea and has been feeling pretty crummy because that looks like that would just not feel good at all on my intestines. So I can feel a little bit of sympathy for this. So when should our patients come see us after they've started having vomiting or diarrhea? And this decision is kind of um, determined by a couple of diff different factors. First of all, the frequency and duration of vomiting. If your patient vomits one time, um, you know, it's probably not warranting of that visit just for a one-time vomiting. But if they're vomiting frequently throughout a 24-hour period, um, or if they've been vomiting for longer than, you know, a day or two, even if it's infrequent, if they vomit once a day for a week, yeah, that's worth checking out as well. Um, maybe even once a day for three days might be worth checking out. Mm. If there's ever any blood in the stool or the vomit, that warrants a vet visit right away. Um, blood in the intestinal tract, if it's bright red, that's telling us there's active bleeding from um, either the stomach or small intestine if we're seeing the blood in the vomit, or there's active bleeding from the colon if we're seeing um, blood in the stool. And those are things that we need to treat right away because if we don't, then all that beautiful bacteria, even the normal stuff that's in the intestinal tract can get into the bloodstream. And then that can lead to sepsis or um, blood poisoning for our patient and that can be extremely serious. So we want to see any patients with blood in the vomit or stool. And then if the patient's lethargic or depressed. So if we have if you look at this poor little golden pup here on the right, um, that dog feels terrible. It's vomiting, it's having diarrhea, and it feels pretty crummy. You can also see it needs some fluids. So um, we want to see patients who are depressed or lethargic as a consequence of the vomiting and diarrhea. If you have you know, a patient who's really bouncy, jumping around, vomited one time, um, you know, they may not be at risk for a problem. Or if you have a dog with diarrhea, um, <clears throat> especially after getting into something silly like the garbage um, or eating, you know, a whole bunch of cheese or something like that. Um, they may not, they may not have to have veterinary care right away, um, but they can get dehydrated really quickly from vomiting and diarrhea. So, you know, you want to alert owners to watch for, um, you can teach them how to check mucous membranes. You can how to check skin tint to see if their pet is dehydrated. Um, the other thing that you'll want to mention whenever you talk to an owner on the phone, because you will get calls all the time, and there's a person on the phone whose dog is vomiting or having diarrhea. And especially when they have diarrhea, that seems to bother owners the most because a lot of times that diarrhea will happen in the house. And uh, so you'll see a lot of patients very quickly. Most of the time the owners don't, uh, don't necessarily call and ask advice, they just ask when can we come in and you can give our pet medicine to stop the diarrhea. Alright, so as you guys know, one of the very important things that you may do as a technician is to collect history from your clients when they bring their pets in for a visit. And when you're getting this history, it's important to differentiate between uh, whether your patient is vomiting or regurgitating. Vomiting and regurgitation are different and they're caused by different um, medical conditions. And so it's important to kind of figure out exactly which one the patient is doing um, because that will really help us, you know, kind of pick our diagnosis, or sorry, not well, pick our diagnosis, but especially pick our, pick our diagnostics to um, try and diagnose the patient. So let's talk about these differences. Vomiting. Vomiting is, is what you think of. Um, this is forced expulsion of stomach contents. So the important thing to note here is that 
when vomiting is happening, unless unless you're not in the room, um, but if you're in the room with a, an animal who's vomiting, you know it's coming. Um, they retch. They make a lot of they make those noises that you know in the middle of the night if your cat's about to bring up a hairball, it will wake you up. Um, so retching or kind of an active um, abdominal um, contraction, active abdominal contraction, um, then the vomit will come up. Um, you know, after a few retches. Um, and so that's a forced expulsion, forced pushing out of the co stomach contents. Regurgitation is very passive. It just happens. Um, the patient does not have any retching, no abdominal contractions, nothing to signal it's going to happen. Just all of a sudden they go bleh and, you know, some stuff comes out. It kind of depends on when they've last eaten, what they ate, um, what comes out, but a lot of times it's partially digested food that kind of comes out looking like a tube, and that tube is the shape of the esophagus. <clears throat> so it kind of uh, depends on the patient what you're going to see. Now we do tend to see vomiting a lot more often than regurgitation, um, but regurgitation is caused by a couple of specific conditions that um, are really important to know about. So you always want to ask the owner, is your pet actively like you know it's coming you, you can even like demonstrate which i will do a lot i'm sure if i had recordings of me in an exam room um trying to demonstrate vomiting uh, i'd be embarrassed so i won't do it here i won't make you listen to it but you guys know what i'm talking about um so it's good to ask the owner specific questions about vomiting and regurg other questions to ask the owners um so here's our vomiting regurgitation question is there abdominal effort or is it more passive? And sometimes you'll have to elaborate on that, but um, you know, by, by showing the owners what you mean. <laughs> um, the frequency of the vomit. What does it look like? Now, in, with the advent of um, cell phones with cameras on them, um, which is uh, technology we didn't have when I first started practicing 15 years ago, um, I didn't get as many pictures of diarrhea and vomit as I do now. Uh, I get a lot of pictures sent to me of vomit um, and <laughs> diarrhea. So, um, but it's helpful because then I can see what it looks like. I can see what this patient is uh, bringing up. I'm going to ask if the, the vomit has digested or undigested food. If there are any non-food items. Um, I actually had a student email me uh, uh, three days ago, three, four days ago, because her cat had vomited a bunch of hair ties. And um, so that was important information. <laughs> and uh, that pet, we were worried because, you know, we don't know how many hair ties she ate. She vomited six. Are there more in there? Um, and so my recommendation to that student was to have the, the patient looked at, have her cat looked at, and see if um, maybe x-rays might be in order um, before rolling into the weekend. So, you know, I mentioned dogs, but, you know, of course, cats are not immune to eating silly things. Um, again, you're going to ask about fresh blood in the vomit. And then you're also going to ask if the vomit had a coffee ground appearance. And the reason we ask this is that when blood gets digested in the GI tract, it actually looks like coffee grounds. It gets very dark, um, kind of a reddish brown. And if it is vomited up before it can move through the rest of the intestinal tract, it'll look like the dog has vomited coffee grounds. And that's important to know because that, again, tells us that there's active bleeding within the GI tract and that it's been going on a while. I mean, if, if the patient has the opportunity to digest some of it um, and get the coffee ground appearance, then we know that that bleeding's been happening at least for a couple of days. And that's important to know so we can make sure that we treat it right away with some protection, protective drugs for the GI tract. All right, lots of questions about diarrhea. You're going to spend a lot of your time, if you don't already, talking about animal diarrhea. When I was preparing this uh, PowerPoint slide, my father-in-law actually gave me a call, and he wanted to use uh, FaceTime, and he asked what I was doing, and I had a picture that we'll, I'll put up in a minute of um, some exocrine pancreatic insufficiency diarrhea was up on the screen. And so I happily showed it to him, and he thought it was hilarious. So, um, yeah, we spend a lot of time talking about gross things in vet med. Uh, so here we go, diarrhea. Um, you're going to ask the owners how many stools the patient's having a day. Um, the frequency of, of defecation is important because um, it lets us know, you know, is this an increase in motility or was this something that, you know, maybe the, the patient is, um, you know, the intestinal tract is moving at a more normal or slower level. Um, so those are important to ask. 
what do the stools look like? Again, that's where the phones come in. Um, but a lot of times owners will also bring in a sample because we will tell them to bring in a sample because we want to test for parasites. And um, it's also helpful because then I can look at it and you can look at it and you can see, oh yeah, there's fresh blood, there's mucus. Um, and because sometimes the owners just won't notice that. And so it's important for us to take a peek at it. And then also for a fecal exam. Um, you're going to ask if they're bulky or thin. Um, that's important to note because it just kind of characterizes and helps us identify the type of diarrhea a little bit more. Um, the shape of the stool, if there is any shape, the color, whether or not that's normal for your pet. How long has this diarrhea been occurring? Um, that's important as well because, you know, sometimes it's really acute and acute treatment can be different than uh, chronic treatment. Diagnostics for chronic diarrhea um, are a little bit more in-depth over time than acute diarrhea, um, which just happened within the last couple of days. So you're going to ask if your pet, if the pet has gotten any better or worse. And if you've given anything at home as treatment, this is a really important question. And you could, in that last question, you can ask, actually the last two questions, you can always ask with any history of a problem in an animal because knowing if it's getting better or worse is important and knowing what the owners have been doing behind your back is important as well. Sometimes if you ask them pointedly, have you given any medicines? They'll say no. And then the more that you probe, you then might find out that they've been giving aspirin or something like that. So um, just ask if they've given anything at home as a treatment. Um, and you can elaborate and ask, you know, any medicines, any over-the-counters, any vitamins, um, anything you have in your, you know, medicine cabinet at home, um, or any food or something like that. So that's important to know because that can um, enhance our ability to diagnose what's going on with the patient and also give us a sort of a teaching moment to encourage owners to not give stuff that they don't, um, they haven't been prescribed for their pet because sometimes we can do more harm than good and there's some toxic over-the-counter substances that people can give to their pets that are going to cause a lot more harm. All right, so when we do our physical exam, we're going to be looking, you know, it's, a physical exam is a physical exam. You should always do it pretty much the same way, but here are some of the things you're going to pay extra close attention to that you are doing anyway, I'm sure. Um, so we're going to especially be aware of the hydration of the patient um, and what that the hydration status is. It is easy for dogs and cats to get dehydrated when they're vomiting and having diarrhea because they're losing a lot of fluid and they probably, especially if they're vomiting, are not taking in as much fluid to replace that. So hydration is extremely important. Patient posture. Um, so if the patient is hunched or, um, you know, lying in a particular manner or maybe keeps looking back at their, at their stomach, this could indicate pain and discomfort and we want to be able to treat that if we find pain because being in pain and also having gastrointestinal signs are, are, that's no fun together. So we always want to treat pain in our patients anyway. Body condition score. This is extremely important because if this has changed uh, with these symptoms or clinical signs of vomiting and diarrhea, that is really significant. We're going to do an abdominal palpation, of course, and feel the belly, feel for any lumps or bumps or tumors or things that shouldn't be there, feel for any pain. But then we're also going to listen to the gastrointestinal tract. And you actually listen in sort of a four-quart quadrant um, manner. You listen in the, on the left and the right in the cranial abdomen, the left and right in the caudal abdomen. And what you're listening for are gurgles and, you know, movement. Peristalsis is what you're hearing, essentially, or the, the, the noises that are created by peristalsis. But you're hearing, like, bubbles popping, and you're hearing gurgles and groans and, you know, little noises that are normal in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, the reason we do that is because if there is an area in the abdomen that's really quiet, that we aren't hearing those little gurgles and pops, um, then we get more worried about a foreign body because if the foreign body is obstructing the flow of the intestinal tract and obstructing peristalsis, it's going to get real quiet in that area of the abdomen. So that's a really helpful diagnostic tool um, for, uh, usually that's reserved for the vet to do, but you know, you guys can do that. There's nothing, there's nothing that says you can't take a listen to a GI tract. And actually, I would re recommend that you do that at your next, um, your next physical exam for your patients, just to kind of get an idea of what that might sound like. Um, whenever I have a patient with 
any kind of GI signs, and also all of my older patients, I do rectal exams. Um, the dogs hate them, cats really hate them, but um, I have found a lot of problems um, when, when I do them, and so they are really helpful diagnostically, especially with an animal with vomiting and diarrhea. I once had a patient who, a uh, little Cocker Spaniel, six or seven years old, she came in for, um, she had vomited a couple of days ago, and then it changed over to diarrhea, and um, she just really wasn't herself, and she was a little lethargic, so mom brought her in and did a full physical exam, and then when I did her rectal exam, I actually found a sewing needle in her rectum horizontally, and I have no idea how that thing made it all the way to the rectum without perforating the intestine and without causing more problems and a little bit of diarrhea and uh, one day of vomiting. So that dog was extremely lucky, but if I had not done a rectal exam, I wouldn't have found it um, because it was stuck horizontally and I don't think that dog would have passed it and eventually could have perforated the intestine. Um, and again, tons of bacteria in there, especially in the colon. If you get a, a hole in the colon, it's going to leak out into the abdomen, and now your patient has a significant bacterial infection in the abdomen, and that is life-threatening. So take-home point, rectal exams are super important for vomiting and diarrhea patients. And then um, oral foreign bodies. This is especially important for cats who have been vomiting um, because they will sometimes eat strings, and the strings can get caught under the base of the tongue. And um, most cats will allow for a very quick examination of the oral cavity, and if you actually press up on that soft tissue um, right at the base of their mandible, kind of where their tongue would be, if you push up on that, you can actually push the tongue up and look at underneath the tongue. And um, I have found uh, three or four times where there's string wrapped around the base of the tongue, and that string dives down into the esophagus and is in the stomach, and sometimes even into the small intestine, and that creates a linear foreign body. And the problem with linear foreign bodies is that the intestinal tract still tries to move, still tries to perform peristalsis. And so what will start to happen over time is that the intestine will kind of start to accordion on itself. It's not as, a, a, well, sometimes it can lead to an intussusception like we looked at earlier, um, but it'll look kind of like, it's called plication, where it looks like sort of like an accordion. And then if given enough time, that string or lin linear object can actually sort of saw a hole into the intestinal tract, and then we've got a septic abdomen again. So lots of big problems can happen um, with a linear. Okay, so let's talk about diagnostics that we can do. Um, here on this image, I've kind of highlighted a few. So urinalysis. Now, urinalysis doesn't seem immediately um, connected to vomiting and diarrhea, but it can help if there are metabolic diseases that are causing the vomiting and the diarrhea. So especially for any patients who are older than, <clears throat> excuse me, four or five, um, doing a UA in addition to your fecal and uh, fecal tests and blood tests and, and x-rays um, can be really helpful. So diabetes may lead to vomiting in your patient and that can be diagnosed sometimes with a urinalysis. Um, if there's glucose in the urine, it can also help to determine if your patient is dehydrated um, or if your patient is, um, you know, kind of adding to the clinical picture if your patient has more significant kidney issues. Um, a fecal exam is mandatory for any patient that has diarrhea, and honestly for the vomiting patients too, just to make sure. But we always want to rule out parasites because, gosh, if you miss something as simple as parasites that are so easy to treat for with the medications that we have available to us, um, then we're not doing a good service to our patients. So always, always fecal exam. Um, a smear and a float or a centrifugation. Um, the centrifugation is the more um, rewarding technique as far as uh, getting, finding more positive results. Um, more parasites are found with fecal centrifugation versus the little floaty guys that we do. Um, but, you know, both are adequate for helping to diagnose parasites in your patient. Um, and then x-rays, super important. So you can see on this picture on the lower left here, we have a dog who has swallowed a bottle cap, and that's that um, very bright white. You can kind of see the bottle cap shape there in the stomach. And uh, so x-rays are really, really important um, for vomiting and diarrhea patients, especially for vomiting patients, because we can find foreign bodies 
or we can see, um, or we can rule out foreign bodies. If we can see that, oh yeah, there's nothing going on in there, it looks great. Um, you know, that can give us peace of mind and kind of take our diagnosis elsewhere. Other helpful tests are the CBC and chemistry profile. So here's an example over here on the right of um, a CBC and chem panel. And all the abnormals are highlighted in red. And so if you look at the top here where it says Catalyst DX, that is the chemistry panel. And you'll see in red we have the BUN, which is 72. Normal is up to about 36, 35, 36. Um, creatinine is 6.0. Normal is up to 2.4. So we have BUN and creatinine are elevated. That is called azotemia and is an indication of decreased kidney function. And it looks pretty decreased in this patient with a creatinine of six. That's pretty high. Um, and then we also see the phosphorus is elevated. And uh, very often when we have a patient in kidney failure or with kidney disease, if they also have an elevated phosphorus, hyperphosphatemia, they feel crappy. They just feel terrible. That phosphorus elevation really seems to make them feel awful. And if you can get that under control, their overall um, way that they feel about life improves greatly. Um, and then also in red is our globulins, which are elevated at 5.6. Um, but albumin is normal down at 2.7. So this indicates that this patient has some degree of inflammation with globulins elevating all on their own. Um, and then if we go down to the section that says Procyte DX, that is the CBC um, automated report. And you can see the red blood cells, hematocrit, and hemoglobin are all low. This indicates anemia. And so if we have anemia, if we have anemia, secondary, or sorry, not secondary too, but well, it is secondary too, but in addition to azotemia, then this tells us that this is a chronic renal failure patient. Patients don't get anemic um, without chronicity of the kidney disease. So this patient is probably vomiting. This patient feels pretty crummy, so it's probably dehydrated and um, is uh, is in the clinic, obviously, because I had some blood work done. So this is really helpful information. This tells us this is not a primary gastrointestinal problem. This is a primary renal problem leading to a secondary gastrointestinal problem. So this is really important stuff to know. Then you'll also see that white blood cell count um, is elevated with neutrophils and monocytes elevated. And that's going to tell us that we have some chronic inflammation going on. And that could be secondary to the kidney disease. It could also be secondary to the inflammation happening because of the vomiting that this patient is undergoing. So lots of good information from our CBC. And then if all those tests are coming back negative or normal, um, then the next step would be ultrasonography. And so you can see here this cat is having an abdominal ultrasound. And uh, this is helping to look for, um, we can see thickening of the intestinal tract. We can see tumors in the intestinal tract and sometimes foreign bodies or foreign objects. Um, and then the sort of yeah, last resort, I don't mean to make it sound so dramatic, but one of the more later diagnostics that we'll do is endoscopy. And this is basically where we have a little camera um, attached to a fiber optic scope that goes down in and helps the veterinarian visualize what's happening in the digestive tract. Um, and then also has tools that can take samples and get a biopsy. Uh, we can also take a patient to surgery to get biopsies if needed, especially for chronic vomiting and diarrhea. So sometimes patients with uh, chronic vomiting and diarrhea will, uh, there, there won't be any abnormalities on their tests. And so endoscopy or surgery to get biopsies of the intestinal tract are the only way that we can diagnose inflammation or sometimes even cancer within the GI tract. And here's our picture of exploratory surgery or even laparoscopy. Um, more and more vet clinics are um, using laparoscopes like we do a lot in human medicine. Um, so we may see that happening a lot more often. Here in the picture on the bottom, we're looking at um, a patient who's having an exploratory surgery. Um, cranial is to the left, caudal is to the right. And if you look in that picture there, you can see um, a metal a metal object, and that big metal object is a retractor, and that's basically holding the um, the wall of the abdomen open so the surgeon can get in there and take a peek at the intestinal tract. Um, that's called a Balfour 
retractor and balfour. And then that piece of intestine that the surgeon's holding in uh, their hands is uh, duodenum. And I know that's duodenum because if you look just below where that piece of intestine is, um, right underneath it, right, that like, kind of light pink color there, um, that is the pancreas. And that's what a normal pancreas should look like. Well, it's not totally normal because there's some inflammation going on there, and I can see a little cyst. But um, that color, that light pink color, is normal pancreas color. And then that pancreas is kind of irritated and inflamed. So um, not totally normal. And then if you look down at the bottom of that picture, um, sort of right where that balfour is attached to the body wall, um, you can see sort of a little kidney-shaped object. Um, and that is this patient's right kidney. You can see the blood vessels going in and out um, at the at the hilus there, at the um, sort of the pelvic area. So that's a pretty cool picture. Surgery's fun. Not always fun for our patients, though, especially if they're having if they have a foreign body or some other kind of GI issues. So what do we do to treat these guys? Well, this entirely depends on what's going on with them. Um, we need to address the primary or underlying cause. Now, sometimes we may not find this. Um, you know, you'll see a lot of patients that will have vomiting or diarrhea um, that have it acutely, that have it briefly, they respond to supportive care, and then it just goes away. So usually we chalk that up to uh, dysbiosis, overgrowth of bacteria, or viral coronavirus, something like that, um, or you know, dietary indiscretion. So those are most of the cases that we'll see of vomiting and diarrhea. However, if our patient has ingested a foreign body, our treatment will be surgery. Or um, if our patient has a chronic vomiting and diarrhea, we may do endoscopy to get biopsy. So treatment, um, and then the treatment will depend on the results of the biopsies. So treatment will just really depend on what's causing the problem. So again, a lot of times we're unable to find that primary source especially in acute vomiting and diarrhea episodes that are not due to foreign body ingestion. Um, so then we, a lot of times, will treat symptomatically or supportive care um, to, you know, just basically support the gastrointestinal tract through its own healing process. And a lot of times the body will repair itself. So let's talk about some of these common supportive treatments that you may see. Um, so one of the things that is really common, especially for vomiting patients, is this concept of NPO. NPO stands for nulla per os, which is um, Latin for nothing by mouth. So you learn PO is by mouth, um, N is nothing, so <laughs> nothing by mouth. And generally, the period of time that we will do this for is 12 to 24 hours. Now, this is veterinarian um, dependent. And it's also patient dependent on what's going on. So the purpose of NPO is to uh, allow that gastrointestinal tract to rest. If you have food poisoning, you will go a particular amount of time where you don't want to eat, but also probably where you shouldn't eat, and just kind of let your GI tract settle down, um, drinking only water you know, to kind of keep yourself hydrated. So this we will do for our patients as well. Now. Um, if our patient is not vomiting, if there's only diarrhea, we generally will not withhold water. And honestly, sometimes I won't withhold food. It depends on how severe the diarrhea is in our patient. Um, but we have lots of good um, gentle foods we can switch our patients to, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, pancreatitis patients, we will sometimes uh, have an NPO period. Although that's becoming more controversial, what we're finding is that the pancreas tends to respond better when it is, when it is fed. Um, so we'll, we may do a little bit of feeding for those patients. But anyway, you'll hear NPO um, for all sorts of things. We NPO patients before surgery too. Um, but it generally means no food and sometimes no water for a period of time. Because when we may not be allowing our patient to have water for a period of time, we may need to supplement with some fluids and electrolytes. And I will do this pretty routinely if I am asking an owner not to give water, is I will give that, that patient some subcutaneous fluids um, to make sure that they don't get dehydrated. So it's sort of a preventive measure. Um, but if your patient is mildly dehydrated, subcutaneous fluids may be appropriate as well. If our patients are severely or moderately dehydrated, 
then they get to stay with us in the hospital and get IV fluids. It's much more efficient to give it that way. Um, you're going to be able to give a larger volume in a shorter amount of time, and you're going to be able to make that patient feel much better. If any of you guys have ever had an experience of being dehydrated, you know that it feels terrible. And, um, you know, sometimes we hesitate to say, oh, well, let's keep your patient in the hospital because owners don't like to do that. But honestly, the, the animals can get better much more quickly if they have some IV fluids on board, especially if they're moderately or severely dehydrated. Um, so that's important to keep that in mind, um, that patient care aspect. You know, we always have to make decisions or recommendations that are to the best care of our patient. Patient care is the number one thing. You guys are going to get sick of me saying it, and I hope that, that you do, because that means I'm saying it enough. <laughs> You're getting sick of me saying it. But patient care should always be our number one priority, and making these guys feel better should always be our first priority no matter what. Um, so anyway, fluids, good stuff for our patients. And then the amount of drugs that we, or the type of drugs that we give, um, is patient-dependent as well. It depends on what's going on, what they, you know, what's causing the problem, um, and uh, how severe things are. So we will give antibiotics if we feel like there is a dysbiosis. Down at the bottom left, you'll see metronidazole. Um, when you work animal care, you'll see a lot of metronidazole in our canine and feline patients because a lot of them do get a stress diarrhea that is exacerbated by dysbiosis. And metronidazole is a drug that can help to minimize the sort of, quote, bad bacteria that we've got in the intestinal tract. The other cool thing that metronidazole does, and this is sort of a fun side effect, is metronidazole can actually decrease inflammation in the colon. So if the colon's really inflamed and angry and irritated, it's not going to be absorbing water very well. Um, it may bleed because the lining is inflamed. And that can cause some problems, you know, additional problems for your patients. It can worsen the diarrhea, and it can also make them susceptible to sepsis. Because whenever we have blood in the GI tract, that means we have open blood vessels. And if we have open blood vessels, we have bacteria that can get inside them. So we're going to prevent that as much as possible. So you see a lot of metronidazole. Uh, it's a great drug. Um, Sacrophate and pepsid, those are gastroprotectants. So we're protecting the uh, upper intestinal tract, the stomach. And then Serenia. Oh, Serenia. Serenia is an antiemetic, which means it prevents our patient from vomiting. And this is a canine feline only product. And this is a product that um, has just been, I hate to be dramatic, but it's been revolutionary <laughs> for our patients in um, preventing and treating nausea and vomiting. Um, it's a really powerful drug. So we may choose some combination of these drugs um, depending on our patient's clinical signs and what's causing them. Cool thing about Serenia, too, is that it also um, decreases pain in the abdomen um, specifically. And they're not really sure what the mechanism of that is, but it's sort of a side effect that we've been seeing with Serenia, um, which is exciting because a lot of times our patients have pain if they're vomiting, so kind of a two-in-one. So communication with our owners is really critical, especially with vomiting, um, but also with, with diarrhea, but, but especially with vomiting, because, you know, whenever we have a patient who's vomiting, there's always the potential for a foreign body. Um, most owners, you know, if they don't see their pet eat something, then, you know, you're just not sure. So you always have to assume until proven otherwise that that patient has eaten something that it shouldn't, or you at least need to be on the lookout for it. Um, so we need to communicate with uh, the owners when they need to bring that pet in and when they need to bring that pet back if symptoms are not improving. And so that's something that you'll work with the rest of your team on um, and uh, communicate that information to the owner. It's always a good idea to have this info written down in a discharge instruction so that owners can refer to it back when they get home and, uh, you know, so they don't have to remember, remember. They can just kind of look at the paper and, and make sure that they're doing everything that they need to be doing. Um, and if the patient is improving, then we can add water if we have withheld it, and then we can introduce them back to a bland diet. And when I say bland, um, I'm not exactly speaking of the, the flavor, although I assume that the flavor is not particularly striking. So maybe it is just, maybe it is also bland in taste, but I don't eat a lot of dog food, so I can't really say for sure. 
Um, but the other thing that a bland diet is going to do is going to minimize the amount of fat and minimize the amount of um, you know, other added compounds that could irritate the GI tract. So we're going to give, I sometimes will refer to this as a gentle diet um, because it really is a, a diet that is highly digestible and more gentle on the gastrointestinal tract. So I have a couple options for a bland diet. Um, the one that I generally tend to reach for are, is the picture on, the pictures on the top here, which are prescription diets. The reason I like prescription diets is that these are um, nutritionally complete. They are um, formulated to give your patient full nutrition, not just proteins and carbs, but also vitamins, minerals, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, um, other compounds that they need for full body health, not just intestinal health. Um, so we use a lot of uh, ProPlan um, EN here for our canine patients, and that's specifically designed to be highly digestible and non-irritating to the gastrointestinal tract. So it's good stuff. Um, and then I really like ID. I'm a huge fan of the Hill's prescription diets, and that's just my preference. Everybody um, has their own preferences of prescription diets, but I've, I don't know, I'm a Hill's, I'm a Hill's DVM. Um, with my preferences. So I really like ID, especially for cats. They seem to like the flavor of it better than the Purina EN, but I think EN works great too. And there are a couple other com companies that have um, diets that are formulated um, for gastrointestinal health. In a pinch though, if your owners are not wanting to purchase food or if they are, you know, would just rather cook at home. If they have a little dog, a lot of times they will cook at home. And for big dogs, this is uh, sometimes cost prohibitive. It's almost more expensive to buy the people food and cook for them. I'm also lazy. I don't know if I mentioned that. I'm super lazy. So I don't want to cook for my dog. It's hard enough to cook for myself and my family. So um, I like opening cans and scooping kibble. So um, anyway, <laughs> you can have your owners make a homemade diet. So to do this, you're going to use one part boiled meat. And it's important to boil that meat. You can see how gross the hamburger looks here in the bottom picture. When it's boiled, it kind of turns that weird tan gray color. Um, but you want to boil it till all the pink is gone. And the fat will kind of uh, be extracted with the water when it's boiled out. It will you know, dissolve in the hot water. Um, you don't want to fry. You don't want to saute. Um, you don't, don't really want to bake. Oh, I don't know if you can bake hamburger. Well, you can, but it's just weird. So don't grill, fry, or do anything to the hamburger. Just boil it, um, and then rinse it with water after you're done. Um, and that will get the majority of the fat out. Um, even the leanest ground beef will have a little bit more fat than we want our patient to be receiving at the time. Um, and then you can use boiled rice, so about two parts of boiled rice. And you'll feed that in um, small, increasing uh, frequency volumes to your patient. Um, and if they're holding it down, you can continue to feed that. And then over a period of time, and it kind of depends on the patient, but usually over a period of three to five days, um, if they are doing well on this bland diet, you will gradually transition them back to their regular diet. All right, so this is the point in the class period where we would actually take a little break. And so because this is a video, you can take a break anytime you want, but um, this might be a good time. Because uh, I'm going to start talking about specific GI diseases, a couple of things that you're going to see relatively commonly in your practices um, that you should know about. Okay, so we're going to start dramatic first. This uh, condition, gastric dilation or dilatation and volvulus, GDV, um, is something that you will especially see a lot of if you work in um, urgent care or emergency medicine. Um, animals who present with GDV uh, tend to do this or get noticed at least in the later hours of the day. And so a lot of day practices, I mean, I worked in day practice for 13, 14 years, and I think I saw one case of GDV in that whole time, um, whereas the year and a half, two years that I worked in emergency and referral medicine, um, gosh, we would see a GDV almost once a week, for sure once every two weeks. So they happened all the time. Um, so what happens here is that the stomach will become dilated with either food or liquid or eventually gas and will twist over on itself. And that's what's the, where the volvulus comes in. Volvulus means to twist. Um, this is an emergency. Like we are not messing around. This, need, this patient needs to come in ASAP. 
um, what happens is when the stomach flips over on itself, it's going to close off at the cardiac sphincter and close out, close off that in, uh, stomach at the uh, pyloric sphincter as well, at the duodenum. And this is going to prevent adequate blood flow to the stomach. It's also going to prevent adequate blood flow uh, to return to the heart from the abdomen. So this big dilated stomach is actually going to press on the vena cava. It's going to pull on the vena cava a little bit, and that's going to prevent blood from returning back to the heart. Uh, effectively. And then we're also going to get some pressure on the aorta, so blood leaving the heart is going to have a harder time getting to the abdomen. So pretty quickly we've got um, a significant problem. If blood flow is not flowing to organs, we have big problems. Um, the, the decreased blood flow to the stomach can possibly lead to a rupture in the stomach wall or necrosis in the stomach wall which is a significant problem for your patient, leading to shock. Um, and so these patients will come in, usually most of the time if they're caught relatively early, they'll still be walking, uh, but not always. They may be um, recumbent and not able to, to move. Um, if we look at this picture right here on the right, this is a, a radiograph, an x-ray, of uh, your standard presentation for GDV. The big black, um, circular area on the bottom is the stomach. You can see it's labeled, all dilated. And then the sort of uh, folding over piece on top is the um, pylorus and then the py pyloric sphincters way down, uh, that little circle um, towards the cranial aspect of this x-ray. And things just kind of fold over like that um, and trap the air inside and it starts to blow up like a balloon. You can see more air gets trapped in the intestines as well. This is extremely uncomfortable for your patient, really painful. Um, and then oftentimes when the stomach flips over like this, it drags the spleen along with it, and so we can have decreased blood flow to the spleen. So here's a little representation step by step what happens to um, a stomach that gets uh, tors or, or volvu volvulus. Um, so on the left we have that normal stomach, and then what happens is that pyloric um, antrum kind of folds up over the top of the fundus of the stomach, and then we get the rotation. And then um, the, with that rotation, you can see the stomach starts to dilate and fill with gas, and then the blood flow is restricted to and from the stomach and to and from the abdomen, um, and so you start to get some tissue death and necrosis. Um, the image on the right is a radiograph uh, taken with our patient in dorsal recumbency or lying on its back, and you can see again that big dilated stomach and the pyloric antrum uh, very dilated as well. So really not good, not good. So what causes GDV? You know, we're not really sure. We have some ideas, but we're not 100% sure what causes it in every single patient. Um, so there are some factors though, that can predispose a dog to developing GDV. One is breed. Um, we do definitely see a strong breed predisposition with GDV. So the most common breed we see is Great Danes. Um, we just it's they're they're kind of the number one breed we see that in. Also, standard poodles are very high up on that list, and this is because these are large breeds large breeds of dogs with very deep chest. So you can see the space from the, um, uh, from the vertebrae down to the chest is really long or deep as compared to, you know, say a uh, Shih Tzu or Bulldog or you know, even that little Chihuahua mixy thing um, in the corner of the Great Dane picture. So a lot of space in which that stomach can swing around and flop over on itself. Other breeds that are represented in the GDV um, category are St. Bernard's, Irish Setters, Greyhounds, and Dobermans. However, it can occur in any breed. Um, it's exceedingly rare in cats. I don't think I've ever heard of a case in cats, but I suppose it's possible. But really, we see it almost exclusively in dogs, big dogs. Um, but I've also seen a Cocker Spaniel with it um, at one point. So it can happen in other breeds as well, but it's the big guys that are the most at risk. We see an increased incidence of GDV with age, and the theory there is that the mesenteric ligaments, the mesenteric, the mesentery and the mesenteric attachments weaken and kind of get a little bit stretched over time, and that can make that stomach more um, able to flip over on itself. And um, so we, we do see an increased risk of GDV as our patients age. 
Also, the manner in which they eat can affect whether or not the stomach is sort of primed for, for flipping and for dilating. So um, if your dog eats really, really fast, um, this is something to consider because that can increase their risk of GDB. Um, we want to make sure we don't feed one large meal um, per day to the average big dog. Um, though if they eat it all in one sitting, that can be too much food for their stomach all in one, one go. And that can increase sort of the, um, uh, like think of the gravity of having a whole, you know, full day's worth of kibble on the ventrum of the stomach. And then that kind of swinging back and forth as the dog is moving around, um, that can just predispose them to having that volvulus occur. Also, um, ingesting a lot of air as they're eating can, and especially if they're eating too quickly, can uh, cause that stomach to bloat up and dilate as well, and that can contribute. And dogs do generally tend to ingest more air when they eat with a bowl on the ground. So you'll see these pictures here with the greyhound um, looking very hungry or something on the right, and then the golden retriever eating like crazy. On the left, um, these are uh, food dishes that are up in stands, and that helps to decrease the amount of air that these animals swallow as they're eating. Um, Stevie the Wonder Dog is a very, very fast eater, my dog, and so he has a puzzle bowl that I use to slow him down um, so he doesn't ingest as much air, and that helps a lot for him. He has a very deep chest as well, so I get a little bit anxious about GDV for him. And then exercise. So, <laughs> If your pet, pet or patient eats a big meal and then goes out and runs around, we might have a problem with GDB. Again, the gravity of having a lot of food in the stomach, running around, jumping around, um, and that stomach just kind of swings around inside the abdomen and can flip over on itself. This is why um, I'm very strict with my crazy dog, because uh, he is a huge fan of retrieving any possible object. And so he doesn't get to play um, for at least an hour after eating. Um, and he's kind of figured that out a little bit. Like, we just don't play after that. So we try and play before eating um, and not after. But all that to say, um, exercise after eating can definitely um, make GDV more common. So um, you want to talk to, especially your big dog owners about that, especially Great Dane owners, Doberman owners, standard poodles. Um, to give them a heads up. And a lot of owners of those types of breeds come in knowing about GDV, which is really nice. They have some knowledge about it. Animals that are hospitalized or boarded um, have an increased stress, and we do see more GDV cases happening with those patients. Um, not really sure what the mechanism for that is, um, but it is just noted in the literature that animals who are being boarded um, have an increased risk for GDV. That doesn't mean all of them will do it, but we just see, you know, it's a lot of times where a dog's in a kennel and the boarding kennel calls us and, um, you know, most of the, the workers in, in boarding facilities understand what to look for with GDV. Um, and so we get calls occasionally for, for that. All right, so let's talk pathogenesis. Love that word. Pathogenesis basically means how the bad stuff gets started. Um, so, or how the disease happens. So when that stomach twists up on itself, like we showed in that picture a few slides ago, obviously material can't pass in either direction. So if the animal eats, uh, a lot of times they'll regurgitate, not really vomit, but regurgitate the food back up. Although typically once the stomach twists, they don't want to eat anything. But then nothing can escape the stomach either. So we get a buildup of fluid, we get a buildup of gas, um, and that stomach starts to dilate. That gas accumulation is going to stretch the stomach, and that is going to press against the aorta and the vena cava, decreasing blood flow back to the heart and decreasing circulation throughout the body. And that's going to lead to shock in your patient. Their blood pressure is going to drop, their heart rate is going to elevate, um, they're going to have pale mucous membranes, and they're going to feel rotten. And then as long as the stomach starts to lose its circulation, and the, the wall of the stomach actually starts to die and become erotic, and that's uh, similar to oids. But to get to the patient as quickly as possible, if you ever have a uh, claim all, I mentioned that their animal stomach is distended. Um, have them come right away. Worst case scenario, they have GDV and you've, you've may save their dog's life. Best case scenario, um, it's fine. You know, and it's not a GDV, but it's always a good idea to have the animals come in.
All right, so here's another image of the rotation down at the bottom. So a patient ate too fast and stressed, maybe it had just one large meal a day and went out and ran around, and that stomach flips over on itself. Um, and now we have compromised blood flow, and you can see that sad dot on the right with that distended abdomen. Sometimes, I mentioned before, the spleen may be caught in the disc, so the spleen is attached um, to the stomach, um, sort of at the body of the stomach, and as the stomach flips, the spleen is going to be pulled out of its location. And when that happens, that can cut off blood supply to the spleen as well, and uh, the removal of the spleen would be necessary um, as part of the treatment of GDD. Um, as all this, this uh, stretching and um, you know, blood supply problems to the gastrointestinal tract is happening, we can get bacteria starting to release endotoxins. And this is a normal thing that bacteria do, um, but if, if our stomach is unable to sort of resist those endotoxins anymore because it is not healthy, um, we can get absorption of those endotoxins into the bloodstream, and then we can get an exacerbation of the shock, the vascular shock our patients already receive, are feeling, and get endotoxic shock. Um, and in this case, every organ is affected, um, and your homeostasis is all out of whack. So these patients feel pretty terrible, especially if they are left to go for any particular amount of time. And if this condition isn't caught soon enough, um, it can be life-threatening, and the, the patient can die because of it, and it's a pretty terrible death. So clinical signs of gas, uh, ga bleh, <laughs> gastric dilation and volvulus. Um, so I'm, it's our shock signs are what we're mostly going to see. So patients will have pale mucous membranes. They'll be very restless and unable to be comfortable. They may be pacing because they, they are painful. Um, sometimes they'll be salivating, again, because of nausea and pain. Um, and then the next one is unproductive retching. This is really common, and owners may say, my dog's trying to vomit, but nothing's coming out. That's a warning sign. Big warning bells and red flags should be flying through your brain when you, when you hear that from an owner, um, and they should be told to get to the vet clinic immediately. Distension of the abdomen, so this poil will be go up in the top. And remember I said any, any breed can, can get this. Um, here's a beagle with GDV, very distended abdomen. Um, it's better to get them before they get that severe, but sometimes you don't have that opportunity. Patient will be tachycardic as a result of the um, shock that they're feeling and pain, and sometimes may also have arrhythmia secondary to that, especially if the spleen is being damaged. Um, you may have uh, ventricular premature contractions um, if the spleen is showing some damage. And very often their breathing is going to be shallow and ra rapid um, and may even fall into the category of dyspnea. So how do we diagnose this? Um, well, those, those x-rays, it's really, um, you know, your patient's going to be in shock, pale mucous membranes, weak pulses, lethargic, and their abdomen's going to be distended very often when you see it. And it's also going to be tympanic. Um, it will, if you were to tap it on one side, you can actually, it feels like a, a blown up balloon, um, and that's the tympanic feel. Um, but x-rays are our definitive diagnosis, so, you know, very often a veterinarian will see a dog from across the room come walking in with a distended abdomen, and, you know, if, if they're doing something else, they'll just be like, get it to x-ray, and we need to find out if that's a GDV or not, and this is how we make our definitive diagnosis. So we take a right lateral abdominal film, and we look for this characteristic picture, which is called the double bubble, so we have the big bubble on bottom and little bubble on top. Or sometimes it's referred to as a Smurf hat, and if you are a child of the 80s like I am, um, the Smurf hat is something that resonates pretty, pretty succinctly with you. Um, but that, that big dilated stomach, especially with that secondary bubble on top, is our diagnosis of GDV. So treatment. we got to treat the shock on these patients, and really before we do anything else, we need to get them stabilized. So we generally will bolus IV fluids, give it a lot of fluids in a relatively short amount of time. They will need oxygen therapy because they're not perfusing very well, so they need all the oxygen they can get. And vasopressors if, and I didn't finish my sentence apparently, vasopressors if the blood pressure is really low. Antibiotics are given um, usually intra-op and po post-op. Um, to uh, treat the endotoxic shock that the patients may be going through. And then we need to relieve this 
stomach distension. Um, so one process that we might do for our patient is something called trocarization. And trocarization is simply to put a, um, a sharp instrument, um, usually a large gauge needle or catheter, into the stomach um, from the outside of the body. And so what I will do in these cases is um, take a, usually like an 18 or 16 gauge IV catheter, and with some pain medicine on board for our patient, um, we'll clip an area of hair on um, the side of the patient on the abdomen and then just and prep it aseptically and then just uh, penetrate the stomach and the body wall with the catheter. Take out the stylet and leave, leave the nice silicone catheter in there and um, just basically gently depress the stomach to try and help get some of that air and gas out. Um, then once we do that and kind of relieve that pressure, that a lot of times will help to treat the shock as well because again, there's not as much pressure on the vena cave and the aorta. Um, and then those patients, once they're stable, are ready to be anesthetized. And you can see the golden retriever on the top is uh, heavily sedated or anesthetized. And then we'll place a stomach tube. And the way that we do that is just, again, sedating this animal uh, lightly or, or significantly, kind of depending on where they are. And then using a really uh, large diameter silicone tube that we pass down through the pharynx, into the esophagus, into the stomach. and. Uh, just sometimes by virtue of passing that tube, the stomach will sometimes unravel a little bit um, or completely and un, uh, unvolvulus, untorus. Um, but then you'll see in that picture on the top with the golden, there's all that uh, gross stomach fluid coming out. And that's, we're alleviating the, um, the air that's, and gas that's uh, accumulated there, but then also some of the liquid and getting some of that gastric juice out of there to make the stomach less irritated. Um, so that you do is that's part of relieving that stomach distension as part of getting the shock under control and making your patient more comfortable. And then once your patient's stable, you've got to take them to surgery um, in almost every case. So surgery is going to be to evaluate the stomach and repair any damage that you see. So if there is a um, degree of a necrosis in the stomach wall, sometimes you have to take part of the stomach out. If there is um, the spleen has had a decrease in perfusion for too long, you gotta take the spleen out. And then you gotta fix the stomach and put it back. Um, and then once you put it back and you take out anything you need to take out that's abnormal or, or um, necrotic, um, then we affix the uh, stomach to the body wall with a procedure called a gastropexy. And if you remember back to med terms, pexy means to affix to, and the gastro is stomach, so we're affixing the stomach to the wall of the abdomen, basically anchoring it so it can't twist over on itself again. The picture on the bottom, you can see that shiny uh, silver Balfour retractor again. Um, towards the top of the picture is uh, the cranial aspect of the patient. Towards the bottom of the picture is the caudal aspect of the patient. And what we're looking at there is a big dilated and twisted uh, stomach. So that surgeon is about to flip that stomach over um, and then you see those red streaks on the, they're kind of going horizontally on the stomach. That's areas where there's a lot of uh, congestion of blood, the inflamed and irritated, uncomfortable stomach. So once you, uh, you know, once your patient is out of surgery, the gastropexy has been completed, um, then post-operative monitoring is really critical. They can go into shock again. Um, they can also have arrhythmias, especially if the spleen's been damaged. And we talked about ventriculum on the top of the screen here, which is the one that we've seen a couple of times. We have normal beat, normal beat, VPC, normal beat. Um, and then at the bottom screen, this is a new one for you guys. Um, we have these VPCs. You can see how they're kind of bizarre. They're a little bit wider. They don't follow the normal pattern of the other sinus rhythm that you see there. Um, and then you'll notice that there's a run of four, one, two, three, four, um, right here in the in kind of the middle of that picture, that is cause for alarm. That's more than three, so you want to let your veterinarian know that's happening. Um, we're going to slowly introduce water and food to this patient when it's appropriate. And in some instances, we might do feeding tubes. We might do a nasogastric tube or even an esophageal tube so that we can trickle food and nutrients in um, small volumes so the patient doesn't have to eat. The patient may feel really crummy still for several days after the surgery. Um, maybe even for longer. 
and they may not want to eat right away. So we, we might have to place a feeding tube in order to get them eating. <clears throat> Sometimes the animal will bloat and not, uh, so they'll dilate but not have the volvulus. Um, Sometimes medical management can be successful with that. So you can decompress. And uh, sometimes even just decompressing with a volvulus can make the stomach flip back over on itself. Um, and so that can be successful for a short period of time. But typically, um, if the patient has done this once, they will do it again. And so we don't generally recommend medical management unless the owner has decided that under no circumstances will they do surgery. If you can get the stomach to untwist, then um, it might buy them a little bit of time. But a lot of times it, they don't untwist. You just have to take them to surgery. All right, so we started really dramatic with GDV, and now we're going to kind of back off a little bit and tell you about some less exciting things to go over here. We've done background pancreatic insufficiency, or EPI, in the past. We're just going to kind of go over it again. Um, this, again, is the inability of the pancreas to produce enough enzymes for digestion. And the pancreas should be uh, uh, distributing uh, pancreatic enzymes like trypsin, amylase, and lipase, and also chymotrypsin, which is a um, precursor to trypsin. It helps to break down proteins. Um, so these generally will get distributed into the duodenum to help break down the um, digestion, digestive, or sorry, break down the food that the patient has just eaten, eaten for digestion. The pancreas is also going to secrete sodium bicarbonate into the duodenum, and this is going to help to neutralize the hydrochloric acid from the stomach. So remember, the stomach has a very low pH and uh, is secreting hydrochloric acid to kind of help start the breakdown process of the food. Once the material from the stomach moves into the duodenum, all that acid will, will cause a lot of trouble um, in the small intestine, and so the pancreas neutralizes the hydrochloric acid with sodium bicarb. And then we're also going to have uh, absorption of vitamin B12 from the small intestine is helped by the pancreatic uh, enzyme release. So when those enzymes aren't working properly and aren't digesting our food properly, we get exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Um, this is uh, due to the atrophy of that pancreatic tissue in the uh, pancreas. And we don't always know what causes it. We do know that uh, there is a strong genetic predisposition in the German Shepherd dog, um, which are the, the guys that you see here. Um, patients that have chronic pancreatitis or diabetes are also at increased risk of EPI. Um, so if the pancreas is just kind of getting exhausted from chronic pancreatitis, it can, it can turn the corner into EPI. Um, or an animal that has uh, diabetes and lack of insulin production cells can eventually start to get a decrease in the, the cells that produce the um, enzymes for digestion. Many different kinds of breeds can get this, though, even though about half of the ones we see are German Shepherds. Um, and there's no breed predisposition in cats, um, but we do see it in cats as well. And uh, I have seen it several times in the diabetic feline patients that I've had. So um, I think there's a little bit of an increase in diabetics for um, EPI in cats. All right, this is that picture I was telling you about that um, I showed my father-in-law. So uh, <laughs> um, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency can lead to chronic diarrhea, typically, because our patients are not able to digest. And um, because they can't digest, that um, stool is not getting um, properly absorbed either. And so you have a lot more liquid, and you have a lot more softness uh, to the stool. You generally pretty large amounts, um, again, because we're not getting proper digestion and absorption, and can sort of look like a cow pie. Um, and also, oftentimes, it's kind of tan and watery, sometimes shiny if there's excess fat, which is called steatorrhea. Um, so excess fat in the feces may be present as well. Uh, these dogs and cats generally will have pretty significant weight loss, but with a normal appetite. And again, that's just because they're not digesting their food. So they're eating like crazy because they're starving, literally, um, but they, they can't digest. So they're not able to absorb the nutrients that they need. Um, typically, these dogs uh, are young, and uh, the cats, well, the cats will vary, but most of the dogs will be pretty young and usually feeling pretty good otherwise, besides the fact that they're starving. 
Um, occasionally, they'll have coprophagia, which is eating their own stool, pica, which is eating things they shouldn't eat, and vomiting as a secondary um, clinical signs of EPI. Um, and this is just, again, because they're so depleted in the nutrients that they need. Um, they'll just, they're looking for trying to get those nutrients anywhere that they can. Also, when we don't have proper digestion going, we can mess with our normal flora, and so bacterial overgrowth is really common in these guys, and that just contributes to the diarrhea and makes it worse. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of um, distress going on in the intestinal tracts of these animals. So questions for the owner, you're going to ask about, again, the frequency of bowel movements, the volume, any changes in the consistency, color, and odor, whether they're straining to defecate. Um, you're, of course, going to ask what it looks like and look at the pictures or the sample that they, they brought along with them. Um, the physical exam, the abdominal palpation and auscultation, sometimes we might have increased GI signs because the patients might be a little more gassy, um, so that might happen, or they could appear completely normal. Um, it's not uncommon to find nothing out of the ordinary when you do an abdominal palpation and auscultation on these EPI patients. Um, the body condition score is usually pretty low because of weight loss or a lack of ability to gain weight if it's a really young animal. And then otherwise, typically the, the PE is unremarkable because um, these guys are healthy otherwise. So the test we send out is the, um, the TLI test. And this is the trypsin-like immunoreactivity test. And this is going to measure the amount of trypsinogen in the blood. And uh, if this is low, then our patient is um, positive for EPI. Luckily, this has a good treatment. We add enzymes to the food. And so you usually do this about 15, 20 minutes before you give the food to the patient. You'll sprinkle these enzymes on top. Um, it helps to start the um, uh, breakdown process of the food even before it's in the patient. So you're basically adding enzymes for the patient. Um, these guys are going to eat a low-fat, high-quality protein diet, oftentimes with rice um, added as uh, a good carbohydrate source that is also um, I'm going to provide some protein as well. Sometimes they'll need multivitamins, again, because their absorption is not as good as it should be. And uh, occasionally we'll use an oral histamine blocker for these guys to reduce stomach acid, so an H2 blocker um, like famotidine or ranitidine, pepsid, or Zantac. Um, and that will help to reduce the stomach acid. That will get in the, get in the way of these enzymes working properly. And then oftentimes these guys are on periodic antibiotics for bacterial overgrowth. Um, and they do tend to respond pretty nicely to that. So these pictures you've seen before, but here's our little, little German Shepherd dog, um, skinny, skinny before treatment, and then a more healthy body weight after treatment for EPI. All right, so this last condition, um, inflammatory bowel disease, is not in your notes. So um, pause the video if you don't have um, some paper, or there should be a little bit of space in your notes to put this. Um, and I want to talk about inflammatory bowel disease. This is another thing you're going to see a lot of in clinic, and I think it's important for you guys to have um, some background in this. You're going to see more IBD than you will EPI. All right, so the definition of inflammatory bowel disease is basically excessive numbers of inflammatory cells present in the mucosa or the lining of the intestinal tract. And so these cells could be lymphocytes, plasma cells, neutrophils, and or eosinophil. So you can have some combination or one particular cell type that is um, present there. So an excessive number of inflammatory cells are present in the mucosa of the intestinal tract. This impairs absorption because those cells are in the way. So it's not, you don't have your normal structure of the uh, intestinal lining. And so absorption doesn't happen the way that it should. All these inflammatory cells are in the way and they're jacking stuff up, releasing cytokines and chemical mediators and causing swelling and edema. And it's just, get out of there. They're causing problems. Um, your GI motility, your patient's GI motility is going to be increased as a result of the inflammation. And so you're a lot more likely to see diarrhea and sometimes vomiting um, because especially if we have uh, inflammation in the stomach or the duodenum, that is going to um, contribute to trying to get material out of the intestinal tract uh, the shortest way possible, which up in the beginning of the intestinal tract is going to be vomiting. 
So your patient's clinical signs are going to totally depend on the location of the inflammation. So some animals have inflammation just in the upper part of the GI tract, the stomach, the duodenum. Some animals have it just in the lower part of the GI tract, like the colon, and some animals have it everywhere. So if we see inflammation in the stomach and the duodenum, we're more likely to see vomiting, plus or minus diarrhea. If we see it in the large intestine, then we almost always have diarrhea and sometimes weight loss with the patient as well. You have increased motility, which is causing an increased frequency in defecation. Sometimes the patients will strain to defecate, and it's not because they're constipated, but it's because they have so much inflammation they constantly feel like they have to go. Um, and then occasionally we will see hematochesia, which is an awesome word that means blood in stool, and then increased mucus production because of all that inflammation in the colon. You will see that mucus on, um, on or in the stool that's passed. So how do we diagnose these guys? Well, we need ideally we need biopsies in order to diagnose them. We need to see what the lining of the intestinal tract looks like under um, the microscope and see do we have an infiltration of inflammatory cells. And if we do, then we treat it accordingly. So this uh, DVM here is using an endoscope. You can see she's looking down through the, um, the eyepiece. And then that scope is being introduced into the dog's esophagus, down into the stomach and the duodenum. And uh, what she's seeing is over here on the right. So the picture on the top is normal intestine. You can see that's a light pink color. You can see the blood vessels, a little bit of mucus over on the left side. That's normal. Everything looks great there. And then uh, one way that inflammatory bowel disease might look on endoscopy is the picture on the bottom. So you see the... the um, lining of the intestinal tract is a lot more irregular. Um, it almost looks like a cobblestone appearance. So if you've ever been to a city that has kind of like those brick roads or cobblestone roads, it looks really bumpy. That's what we're seeing here instead of that nice smooth surface like we're seeing in the top picture. Um, and then those red splotches, that is um, inflammation and erosion um, that is uh, very irritating and uncomfortable to the patient. So that's what might be visualized on endoscopy. All right, so let's talk about treatment. Medical treatment for inflammatory bowel disease um, includes a lot of different things, and it really depends on what the diagnosis says on your, um, on your biopsy. Um, so a lot of times these guys respond really nicely to a hypoallergenic diet. Um, a diet that's really gentle and formulated for um, animals with different types of allergies. And inflammatory bowel disease, a lot of times we'll treat it kind of like an allergy. Um, it's not technically falling into that category, but it does respond really nicely to medications and foods that allergies do as well. So um, the picture over here on the right is VB. That's a, an allergen-free diet that, that is a prescription diet. Um, sometimes we'll use the gastrointestinal diets like Purina EN and uh, the prescription diet ID will work for some patients, um, but VB works really well for a lot of them too. I had a cat um, with inflammatory bowel disease in the colon, and that was fun. Um, when he would have a flare-up of his inflammatory bowel disease, he would get um, really uh, powerful <laughs> diarrhea with blood, and it would scare him. And so he would run away from his diarrhea through the house, and uh, it would make pretty pictures on the walls. So that was pretty terrible. But anyway, he responded beautifully to VB and lived on that for his, uh, you know, most of his 16 years. So he was he did pretty well on that. Um, we can also use limited ingredient diets that um, are, you know, very specific protein and carbohydrate sources. All right, and then we might use antibiotics, too. They talked about metronidazole before, and it's a use in decreasing inflammation. And again, that's really useful in the colon. Um, so a lot of animals respond really nicely to that. Um, and then also it can help maintain our normal. A lot of animals will need steroids to help decrease the inflammation, at least in the short term, um, sometimes long term, depending. Um, but that all those inflammatory cells need to be told to chill out, and so prednisone um, and other steroids can help decrease that inflammation and relieve their symptoms um, in a lot of cases. 
And then in really severe cases, we will add additional immunosuppressive drugs. And we add these because those inflammatory cells are immune system cells. They're getting out of control and they need to be told to stop it. And so we may add some additional drugs like azathioprine, cyclosporin, chlorambucil. You don't need to remember those drug names, at least not yet, um, unless you're in pharmacology, you might be talking about them. Um, but just know steroids, immunosuppressive drugs are often used in treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. And then probiotics. Probiotics um, help to replace and support the normal flora. Um, so a lot of times we'll use um, products like Fortiflora, seen here, um, or Proviable, which is what we're using down in the, in the animal care right now for our patients. This just helps to support normal GI flora um, and help replace uh, you know, some of those normal bacteria if um, we have a dysbiosis in addition to inflammatory bowel disease. 